Good morning. I'm Lewis Wright, superintendent of the Sunday School here at College Hill Missionary Baptist Church. It is a pleasure once again to welcome you to join us for this on this beautiful Sunday morning as we share a summary of this lesson with you. Our lesson for today is lesson number 12 for May the 17th, 2020. We will still be in our spring quarter and our unit is unit number three, Call to God's Work of Justice. The title of our lesson today is Just Rewards. Our devotional reading for this lesson is Psalms 86, verses 1 through 13. The background scripture is Jeremiah chapter 21. Our print for this lesson is coming from Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 8 through 14. The key verse says, This is what the Lord says to you, house of David. Administer justice every morning, rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 12. And that was from the NIV version. We have today another powerful lesson from an Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was considered one of the major prophets. He delivers God's message to Judah for more than 40 years until the Babylonians took them into exile. During the recording of this lesson, Zedekiah was king of Judah, and he asked the prophet Jeremiah for God's advice as the city was about to be invaded by the Babylonians. As a matter of fact, the Babylonians were on their way to invade the city. The Lord sent Jeremiah with a message for the people of Jerusalem, which is provided in the three outlines in this lesson. The first outline is a choice to make, Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 8 through 10. The Lord told Jeremiah to tell the people, take your choice of life or death. Everyone who stays in Jerusalem will die from war, famine, or disease, but those who leave and surrender to the Babylonians will live. They will escape with their lives because I have decided to bring disaster and not good upon this city. The city will be handed over to the king of Babylon and he will destroy it with fire. The Lord's patience with Jerusalem had run its course because of their disobedience to his word and commandments and they were of the mindset of believing that the Lord was going to protect them, not only because of what they did, but because of who they were. The right of our lesson tells us that sometimes in our lives, when we do not pay, make right choices, God may permit us to be corrected by punishment because we are his children and he loves us. Always choose right over wrong. Your just reward is on the way. Yes. Our second outline is do good or else. Jeremiah chapter 21, verses 11 through 12. This message from God to the house of David was for them to show justice every day. They were to help those who have been robbed and rescue them from their oppressors. God wanted his people, if they fail, to do this. His anger will burn like an unquenchable fire because of all of their sins. As children of God, we are required to set a good example to the lost. We are to read and obey his holy word. His wrath will certainly come to the disobedient, and there will also be a just reward or judgment to the evil, just as there will be a reward for the righteous. Our final outline is no more chances. Jeremiah 21, verses 13 through 14. God wanted the children to know that he was against them. He let them know that they sat on top of the mountain, looking over the valley, believing they were safe from attack. They thought that their city could not be harmed. They even boasted about no one can touch us here and no one can break in. God let them know that he would punish the people for their sins and would light a fire in their forest that will burn up everything around them. 
This was all accomplished by the Babylonians who were at their gates. As Christians, we must be careful not to allow, allow Satan into our hearts and minds to deceive us. He can trick us into thinking that our sins are okay because of who we are and what we have in this world. Remember, God gave it to us and he can take it away. The warning and message to us are the same today. God will not continue to strive with those who intentionally choose the path to destruction and not life. The saved must not take for granted his long suffering, but must seek to live in obedience to his word in view of the coming of Christ when all will receive their either blessings or curses, just rewards. Amen. Amen. I pray that this has been a blessing to you as much as it's been a blessing to me to share this lesson with you. As always, let us end our Sunday school with our closing prayer. And it reads, Dear Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy that gave us the chance to get things right with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. my brothers and my sisters. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are commanded in scripture to rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, it is good for us to be here. I am thankful to God that he has blessed us with another day. Oh yes, if we can wake up in the morning and just open our eyes and see the beauty of God's creation, my brothers and my sisters, what a blessing and what a miracle God has granted unto us. Allow me to preface this message by thanking our superintendent of Sunday School, Deacon Lewis Wright Sr., for another wonderful job with the overview of our Sunday School lesson. He has done another outstanding job and so Brother Wright, we thank you so very much. I pray you have been blessed by the Sunday School lesson this morning. And now it is time to hear a word from the Lord. I pray you have your Bibles with you uh, somewhere around that we can go into the Word of God right now. And uh, listen, go with me now to the New Testament Turn with me to the New Testament, to our Lord's Gospel, as it is recorded by St. Mark. And I want to invite you to that sixth chapter. My message this morning will cover uh, verses 45 through 51. Uh, but for our hearing this morning, I want to lift the 48th verse. Uh, for our hearing. That's St. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 48. It's a powerful passage of scripture. If you look with me, uh, Mark says these words. Mark says, and he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night. He cometh unto them walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. Oh, what a powerful word. What a powerful word. Listen, I have discovered, brothers and sisters, that no matter what we go through, the good news is our Savior sees us. I, I don't care what you go through in life what you may experience from day to day, you need to remember that the Savior sees us. Oh, yes, he does. At the time of our text, Jesus has just fed 5,000 men besides women and children. And he did it miraculously using two fish and five loaves of bread. 
And so being wearied and exhausted from the day, Jesus urges his disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side of Bethsaida while he sends the multitude away. Verse 46 says that after Jesus had sent the multitude away, he went into the mountain to pray. Oh yes, oh yes. You see, even though, even though Jesus had spent a long and difficult day dealing with the, the, the social and spiritual and physical needs of the people, that day drove Jesus to prayer and not from prayer. And brothers and sisters, whether it's fatigue or whether it's our frustrations, whether it's failures or, or, or maybe it could be our flaws, but let me tell you, the burdens of our heart should always drive us to prayer and never away from prayer. Yes, yes, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, once said this. He said, to be a Christian without prayer is like being alive without breathing. Yes, yes. In, in, in other words, church, prayer is, is not only effective, but prayer is essential to our Christian lives. Jesus took the time to pray. Another point I want to make is that when Jesus prayed, he was in the mountain alone. No one but him and his father. He, he was there alone communing with his father. And church, listen, every child of God ought to spend some alone time with God. Oh yes, public worship is good. Public worship is fine. In fact, in fact, public worship has its place, but it does not take the place of private worship. Yes, in fact, in fact, you really can't talk to God the way you want to until you get alone with God. That there are some things that you want to say privately to God that you just can't say publicly. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There, there, there are some needs you may have that you want to talk to God about, about privately, but you don't want to discuss them publicly. There, there are some personal sins that you might need to confess to God privately, but you dare not confess them publicly. Let me tell you, you really can't talk to God the way you want to until you spend some time alone with God. Every Christian, every child of God ought to spend some private time and some personal time and some penitent time with God so that you can pour out your heart to God and tell God all about your troubles. Yes, we, we need to spend some alone time, some private time with God. I never shall forget when I was a student in school. Yes, yes, and, and whenever it was time for me to do some studying, whenever it was time for me to prepare for an exam, I had to find a quiet place. I had to find a secluded place in order for me to study so that I could absorb and retain the material that I was studying. I had to find a place that was away from the hustle and bustle of the crowd. I had to find a place away from the noise of people find a secluded place where I could really study the way I needed to study. Oh, I know today that there are a lot of young people who say that they study best with the television on and they study best with music playing, but I never could study uh, uh, with music playing. I, I, listen, I, I couldn't study today with headphones on my head, with earphones 
in my ear. I have to find a secluded place. I, I need a quiet place where I can really study so that I can learn and comprehend what I'm trying to learn. That's the way it is with us brothers and sisters as Christians. We ought to find a private place. We ought to find a quiet place, a secluded place where we can talk to the Lord. It, it could be in your bedroom. It could be, yeah, yeah, in the kitchen. It, it could be in your automobile. It could be in your office. But whatever it is, you, you need to find a quiet place where you can really talk to the Lord. The Bible says this. J J Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites are. He said they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And they love to pray standing on the street corners to be seen by men. But Jesus said this. He says in that sixth chapter of Matthew and verse number six, Jesus says, but thou, when thou prayest, go into thy closet and shut the door. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to your God who is in secret and your God who hears in secret will reward you openly. Brothers and sisters, we, we got to find some private time to talk to God. That's why I love that song by C. Austin Miles. That, that's why it's one of my favorite songs today. When C. Austin Miles penned the words, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And then he says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Yes, we need to find some alone time with God, Jesus is in the mountain praying, and he prays to his father alone. Yes, yes, he's there by himself praying to his father, and scripture says that he prays until evening. Mark tells us in verse 47, yes, yes, that the boat is now in the middle of the sea, and Jesus is alone on the land. And in other words, the disciples have found themselves caught in the midst of the sea, but Jesus, our Lord, is standing on the shore. Oh, yes, and brothers and sisters, listen, that, that ought to give us some relief and some release because if you find yourself, yes, yes, in the midst of your own sea, the good news is we have a Savior who's standing on the shore. Yes, he is. And watch this. If Jesus is standing on the shore, that simply means that help is on the way. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There, there, there are three things. There are three things I see in this text. Watch this. The disciples are out on the sea. They are there. Yeah, in the midst of the sea, Jesus is on the land, on the shore. But as they are on the sea, uh, the first thing I want to tell you is Jesus watches his disciples. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's right there in our text, in our printed text in verse 48. The Bible says, and he saw them toiling in rowing. Jesus watched his disciples. He was watching them. He Listen, he watched them as they struggled. As they were struggling, they, as they were toiling, they were struggling. He, he watched them as they struggled. Allow me to phrase it this way. Allow me to phrase it this way, church. If Jesus is standing on the shore of my life, I want you to know I'm satisfied as long as the Savior sees me. And I've come to tell you today, yes, yes, that whatever you're going through today, you need to take heart and you need to be encouraged because the Savior sees us. Oh, yes, he does. He, he sees our being battered. 
by, by the ways of life. He, he sees our being bruised by turbulent waters. He, he, he sees our being beaten. He, 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 he sees us being broken. He, he, he sees us uh, with our hearts about to bleed. He, he sees us in need of a blessing. Jesus sees us. You ought to thank God today that he sees our situation. Whatever we're going through, yeah, we serve a God who sees us. He watched his disciples. He saw them as they were toiling in ruin. Oh, that's why I'm glad. I, listen, I got another favorite song that I that I love so well. Listen, it, it was written by Sybilla Martin, and she, she penned this song in 1905, but it has become one of my favorite songs. And she says in that song, she says, she says, why? should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home uh, when Jesus is my portion? My constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. That that's why I can sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Church, you ought to thank God today that we have a Savior who sees us. Yes, 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 yes. Jesus watched them as they struggled. But not only did he watch them as they struggled, listen to this, he also watched with sympathy. Yes, he did. You see, you see his sight is linked to his sympathy. His, his sight is linked to his sensitivity. His, his sight is linked to his solicitude. And so Jesus not only saw them as they struggled, but he watched them with sympathy. That simply means, brothers and sisters, if Jesus sees us, I'm here to tell you, he will come to our rescue. Oh, yes, he will. He will come to our rescue. I ought to have some witnesses out there who know that the Lord will show up in our situation. Whatever you're going through, God will show up. Yes, he does. He'll show up because his sight is linked to his sympathy. And so whatever you're going through, he will not only see what we're going through, the Lord will show up. Yes, how many of you know He'll show up in your pain. He'll show up in your sickness. He'll show up in a global pandemic. He'll show up in the midst of a coronavirus. He, he will show up in the midst of your life, in the midst of your heartache, in the midst of your heartbreak, in the midst of enemies. The Lord will show up. Thank you, God. We serve a God who will show up. Jesus was on the shore, but he watched his disciples as they struggled, and he watched them with sympathy. Oh, yes, oh, yes. They are out there now in the midst of the sea, and Jesus watches his disciples. Secondly, secondly, watch this now. Not only does Jesus watch his disciples, but, but because he's a God who will show up, because he's a God who will come to our rescue. Jesus not only watched his disciples, but watch this, Jesus walks toward his disciples. Yes, yes, he walks toward his disciples. The text says, the text says, and he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea. Can't you see Jesus now? Walking on the sea of Galilee. And brothers and sisters, I don't know how Jesus did it, but I believe what the word says. And the word says he was walking on the sea. I, I, I don't know how it happened, but, but I believe God's word. And God's word says that Jesus was walking upon the sea. All I know is that Jesus is the only God I know. Yes, who can, who can turn a sea into a sidewalk. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Jesus is the only God I know who can turn a pool of water into a pathway. <laughs> he, he, he's the only God I know, church, who, who can turn a lake into a lane. Oh, yes, he can. He, he's the only God I know who can turn a body of water into a bridge. 
Oh, yes, he can. Jesus went walking upon the sea. He was walking on the sea. He, 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 he saw his disciples with sympathy. He saw that they were, were in trouble. They, the Bible says they were toiling in rowing. Watch this now. Watch this. They were toiling and rowing. That, that means that they were toiling with no progress. Mm, they were toiling. They were struggling. That word toiling means that they were straining. Yes, they were struggling. They were, they, they, they were having a hard time. They, they found the task difficult. They found it challenging. They, they, they found it cumbersome. It was a painful task. They, they found it an, an arduous task. They, they were toiling in rowing, but they were toiling with no progress. Lord have mercy. It's, oh yeah, church, they were there. Can't you see them now? In the midst of the sea, toiling. They, 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 they were supposed to be rowing, trying to get to the other side of Bethsaida, but they were caught in the midst of the sea, toiling with no progress. Oh, church, how many times have you been in a situation and it looked like to you that you were making no progress? How, how many times have you been involved in circumstances and you were trying all that you could, but it seemed like you were making no progress. How many times have people been searching for a job? Searching day after day, week after week, month after month, and couldn't find anything. It just looks like they were making no progress. Oh, how many times have people been sick going to doctor after doctor, taking prescription after prescription, and, and instead of getting better, they were getting worse. It just looked like to them they, they were making no progress. Uh, some of you know or have heard of a parent having trouble with an unruly child, uh, trouble with a disobedient child, trouble with a rebellious child, and and no matter how you talk to the child, no, no matter how much you lecture this child, no matter how you discipline the child, it looks like the child is not getting any better. Looks like you're making no progress. Some people have, have known the pain of trying to break a bad habit. And they have tried and tried. They've even gone to the Lord in prayer trying to break this bad habit and, and it seems like they're at a standstill and when they make one, take one foot forward, yeah, yeah, it looks like the devil is there to take them two steps backward. In other words, in other words, they are toiling with no progress. This is what's happening to the disciples. They are out there in the water on the Sea of Galilee. They are toiling, but they are making no progress. Yeah, the scripture says they are toiling in row. And secondly, watch this. Not, not only were they toiling with no progress, but I need to tell you this. I, I, I need to tell you they were troubled by a contrary wind. Uh, the Bible says, the Bible says they were toiling in rowing for the wind was contrary. And church, let me tell you, it's one thing to have trouble in your life. But it's quite another to have trouble and the wind is blowing. I, I, I'm here to tell you, no, 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 nobody, nobody likes a storm. Nobody likes a storm. But, but, but we regret the storm even more if a strong wind is blowing. Oh, bless his name. And here are the disciples out on the Sea of Galilee, the wind is contrary. That, that word contrary means against. It means opposite in direction. In other words, in other words, if the disciples were traveling to the north, yeah, the wind was blowing to the south. <laughs> if the disciples were traveling to the east, it, it, it means that the wind was blowing to the west. It, it was a contrary wind. It was blowing in the opposite direction. It, it's one thing to have the wind at your back, but it's quite another to be on the waters of life and wind is blowing directly on you. 
And it made it, made, made it difficult for them to row. In fact, they, they were toiling in their rowing because of a contrary wind. I've come to tell you today, brothers and sisters, listen, that all of us will face some contrary winds. I'm, oh, yes, I'm here to tell you, in your life and in my life, we're going to face some contrary winds. Some, some contrary winds are going to blow. Watch this. Temptation can be a contrary wind. So some decisions you make can be a contrary wind. Oh, yes, sickness can be a contrary wind. A coronavirus can be a contrary wind. There are going to be some contrary winds in our lives. Yeah. Oh, these disciples were troubled by a contrary wind. They Watch this. They were toiling with no progress. They were troubled by a contrary wind. And I, I need to share something else with you. And, and, and here, here, here's, here, here's a wonderful part of the text. Jesus also knows that he has perfect timing. He, he, he walks toward his disciples because he knows that he has perfect timing. That's the kind of God that we serve, a God who has perfect timing. The Bible says, the text says, about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus cometh unto them. Yes, 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 he cometh unto them, and he was walking upon the sea. He did it at the fourth watch of the night. You Bible readers remember that, that in Jewish time, uh, the night was divided into four watches. The first watch was from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. The second watch was from 9 p.m. to midnight. The third watch was from midnight to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch was from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. The Bible says about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus walks toward his disciples. And he walks to them because he knows he's got perfect timing. Yes, yes. So I, I, I hear some of you now, and I, I, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Brother Pastor, Brother Pastor, how, how can you say Jesus has perfect timing when, when he waited to come uh, until the fourth watch? Well, why, why did he wait until the fourth watch to show up? How, how can you say the Lord has perfect time, and he could have come in the first watch. He could have come in the second or third watch, but he waited until the fourth watch, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. to show up. Well, let me answer your question, brothers and sisters. Jesus waited until the fourth watch. Jesus has perfect time because he knows whenever he shows up, he's always on time. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus knows that whenever he gets there, it's still the right time. I, oh, I ought to have some witnesses out there who know that whenever God shows up, he's always on time. Yes, yes. How many of you have been struggling with some things and, and you needed God to come when you thought you needed him, but he came in his own good time. <laughs> but when he showed up, it was the right time because God has a way of coming just in the nick of time. And I want to tell you, Jesus specializes. Church, he specializes in coming into our lives just in the nick of time. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. It looked like to me. Now, now, this is just me talking. It just looks like to me that God should have shown up before the three Hebrew boys well, put it to the fiery furnace. It, it just looked like to me that these three boys who had served God faithfully, God should have come before they were thrown in the fire. But God waited until they got in the fire to show up. And the king said, I thought we threw in three. But behold, I see four, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Oh, it just looked like to me. It looked like to me God should have should have come to Daniel before Daniel got in the lion's den. It, Daniel prayed three times a day. It, it just looked like to me that a man who was so devout in prayer, God should have shown up 
before they threw them in the lion's den. Yeah. But God waited until they got in the lion's den uh, to show up. He, he waited until Daniel was in the lion's den. And when Daniel got in the lion's den, God changed the nature of the lion and made them lay down and act like lambs. Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all don't hit me. I, I stopped by the take of the day church. We serve a God who comes at the right time because he's got perfect timing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. He, he came to them walking in the fourth watch of the night, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus comes to them and he watches them. He, yeah, he walks toward them now. Yeah, and as he walks, Jesus is watching. As he walks, Jesus is watching his disciples toiling and rowing. And in fact, the Bible says that when he got close to them, yeah, they didn't even recognize who he was. Yeah, they, they thought he was a spirit. They, they, they thought he was some spirit, some ghost, and they cried out in fear. Lord have mercy. And that brings me to my last point. Jesus not only watched his disciples, he not only walks toward his disciples, but I want to close by telling you this, Jesus witnesses to his disciples. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Because in verse 50, Jesus, Jesus recognizing their fear, recognizing the fact that they are troubled, he says, he says, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, he spoke to the Jesus knew that if they heard his voice, everything would be all right. And church, I want you to know sometimes we just need to hear God's voice. We, when we hear his voice talk to us, it calms our fears. It, it dries our tears when we, when we hear God talking to us, when we hear him speaking to us. Oh, it just makes us feel a whole lot better. Jesus witnesses to his disciples. He says, be of good cheer. In other words, cheer up. He says, I'm here now. Cheer up. I'm here now. You don't need to be afraid. I'm right here with you. So I, I came to take it a day. Sometimes we need to just hear his voice. Yeah, that, that, that's why the seasoned warriors used to sing that song. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one. Lay down thy head upon my breast. Yes, yes, yes. And this is what they did. They said, I came to Jesus. As I was, I was weary. Worn and sad, but I found in him a resting place. He has made me glad. Je Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. Let me tell you why Jesus spoke. And I believe he spoke for a few reasons. First of all, he wanted to assure them of his protection. That he, he wanted them to know that they didn't need to fear. Because when you have God with you, you have around-the-clock protection. Secondly, he wanted to accompany them with his presence. Yes, yes, the Bible says that he got into the boat with them. Oh, yes, he did. He, he got in the boat with them. He wanted to accompany them with his presence. Oh, but that's not the main reason. The main reason why he witnessed to them, he wanted to amaze them with his power. Oh, yes, he did. Verse 51 says, verse 51 says that when Jesus got into the boat, the wind ceased. I've come to tell somebody today that God still has power. Whatever you're going through, we serve a God today who still has power. And he can make the wind stop blowing in your life. I know we're going through this pandemic right now, but guess what? God can make the wind stop blowing. I know we have this coronavirus, but God can make the wind stop blowing. Whatever you're going through today, he can make the wind stop blowing. Why? Because he still has power. Let me tell you what kind of power he has. He has, he has redeeming power. He can still save. He can still save your soul. He, he has redeeming power. 
But more than that, God has restoring power. He can bring you back to where you used to be. Aren't you glad today, church, that God has restoring power? But more than that, uh, yeah, I shout because God has resurrection power. Oh, yes, oh, yes, he had resurrection power. He can raise us back to life again. He can raise us from a dead horizontal to a living perpendicular. Yes, yes, he can raise us. He's got resurrection power. And the reason I know he's got resurrection power is because one day he raised Jesus. He resurrected Jesus. Oh, he died on the cross. He was buried in the grave. But early that third day morning, God resurrected him. I came to tell you, he's got resurrection power. He'll raise us today from whatever deadly state we might be in. Brothers and sisters, you ought to rejoice because we serve a God who sees us, who will show up, and lastly, he will save us. Yes, he will. We, we serve a God who sees us, who will show up in our lives, and he will save us. I'm grateful to God that the Savior sees us. Whatever we're going through, our God, our God always sees us. I pray this word has been a blessing in your life today. Oh, I pray that you will feast on this word all this week and take it with you wherever you go, that no matter what we go through in this life, we have a Savior who sees us. And if he sees us, he will show up. Yes, he'll come to us on the waters of life. And when he comes, he will save us. Yes, he will. He will deliver us. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God will show up because the Savior sees us. I want us to pray together now. I want us to pray. And maybe there's somebody here today. You've been battling turbulent waters all your life. You've never given your heart to Christ. You've been trying to do it on your own, but I want to tell you, you can't maneuver the waters of life by yourself. You need God on your side. You need somebody to help you. Help you to maneuver as you sail the seas of life. You need Jesus in your life. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. You can do it right now. You can confess your sins. You can say, Lord, come into my life. I need you. I repent of my sins. I confess my sins. I believe that you died and that you rose again just for me. And the Lord will save you. He'll show up in your life and he'll save your soul. I'm going to ask that you would pray with me right now. Everyone listening to me now, I'm just going to ask that you would bow your heads with me and pray with me. Oh God, oh God, our Father, oh God, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the power of this priest word. Thank you, God, for reminding us that we serve a God who sees us. We serve a God who will show up, and we serve a God who will save us. Thank you, God, for showing up in our lives. Thank you for being there when we need you the most. And Father, if someone has heard this word who does not know you as his or her personal Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that you would come into his or her life and save them right now. Save them by your blood and you can give them resurrection power. You can raise us from a dead horizontal to an alive perpendicular. You can do it because you still have power today. Father, we thank you and we praise your name because you are our Savior who always sees us. Thank you, Jesus. It is in the blessed and beautiful name of Jesus Christ, I pray, and we say together, amen and amen. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer.
When praises go up, blessings will come down. The youth ministry will sponsor a praise parade trunk shower for College Hills High School graduates on Saturday, May 30th at 12 noon outside the church. We are asking each ministry to join the fun as we celebrate our graduates in this unique way. Each ministry is asked to be represented in the praise parade with decorated cars, trucks, and gifts for each graduate. Individual members and families are encouraged to participate. Our graduates are Malayla Walden and Jerry Buddy Mitchell III. Parade details to come. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday, May 30th at 12 noon. Brothers and sisters, we are in the sanctuary of our new facility, and I want to tell you it is a beautiful sanctuary. I know many of you are wondering when are we going to come back into the church building, uh, and I truly cannot answer that question right now. Uh, we want to be safe uh, to the very best of our ability, but I want you to know that whenever we come back, uh, we're ready to worship. As you can see, the furniture has is here. It is being installed uh, now and is just about completely installed. And, and so we're grateful to God for what he has done in the lives of his people. Uh, God is still in the miracle working business. Yes, he is. And he's blessing us in a tremendous way. I need you to be prayerful. Stay prayerful, stay faithful, above all, remain safe as you can be so that we can all come here together and worship our God together as one church family in spirit and in truth. We don't know when that's going to be, but whenever we come, we want to come together as the people of God, as one body in Christ Jesus. God bless you and God keep you.